In October of 1983, Patricia Oshai Colby, class of 32, established the Colby Art Program at SEM in honor of her husband, Robert W. Colby. In 2010, through an additional gift to the fund, the generosity of Mr. James and Mrs. Michael Colby Wadsworth, it became known as the Colby Oshai Program. Its purpose is to foster art education and to develop art appreciation by selecting women as Colby O'Shai artists who have a connection with Buffalo Seminary or Western New York. The artists spend time at SEM and engage students and the school community in the artistic process through exposure to and discussion of their works and careers. It is my honor to welcome our own Caitlin Cass as the 51st Colby O'Shai artist. It is her current exhibition that we will focus upon today, but we cannot focus upon her art without appreciating the artist for all that she brings to SEM. Ms. Cass joined the SEM faculty in September of 2013. In her time at SEM, she has enriched our community not only with her talent, but also with her intellect, her professionalism, and her tireless approach to practicing her art of cartooning. She shares her passion for the arts by teaching our studio arts, mentoring our capstone students, and taking us beyond SEM's walls to experience the impact of art on the larger community. In summing up her current show, Women's Work, Suffrage Moments, 1848 to 1965, Miss Cass said, women fought, lost, fought, won, and fought again. The sense of resilience and dogged determination she expresses through her art reflects the attitude she brings to Sam each day. What a role model for each of us. It is my pleasure to yield the microphone to Miss Caitlin Cass. Other pickets had faced arrest. Their friend, Ada Davenport Kendall, 
sisters were prepared for arrest. Elizabeth even brought her knitting. I'll knit for the soldiers from jail, she says. And then here's a newspaper clipping. Two more Buffalo women to picket line at the Capitol. Mrs. Frances Call and Mrs. A.R. Preston, sisters and nieces of the late Dio Lewis. Still, they must have felt apprehensive. We need to strategize about hiding extra banners. Apparently, angry mobs steal them and tear them to shreds. They went through 148 banners the other day, according to the suffragists. The tension was escalating. A few weeks before, an angry man shot a bullet through a window at the National Women's Party headquarters. The Lewis sisters went anyway. I could not be true to myself and fail to stand by these brave women in Washington. Louise and Elizabeth were from a political family. There they are with their brothers and their parents. Louise was a little bit older than Elizabeth. Their father, Lauren L. Lewis, was a lawyer and New York State Supreme Court justice who came out of retirement in 1901 to co-defend President McKinley's assassin. Someone had to do it. Their uncle, Deal Lewis, was a staunch supporter of Susan B. Anthony and advocated for suffrage amendment in the 1870s. I think the mantle of our uncle must have fallen on us. Their mother, Charlotte Pearson Lewis, helped found the homeopathic hospital and the Home for the Friendless, which was a home for pregnant teenagers and their babies, among other things. Um, and we help those who need it the most, she says. Both Louise and Elizabeth had attended Buffalo Seminary and had sent their daughters here. They were active in the Graduate Association, and Louise judged a debate on women's suffrage at the school in 1912. The pro-suffrage side won, thank goodness, but it wasn't actually a given. By 1917, the sisters were in their 50s, their children had graduated, and they had fewer responsibilities. So when the National Women's Party came to Buffalo to discuss picketing, they signed up. The stakes were raised when they got to Washington. Alice Paul, the notorious leader of the National Women's Party, planned to picket with them. And I intend to get arrested, she says. Perhaps that's when Elizabeth decided to excuse herself. We don't actually know exactly why Elizabeth didn't end up protesting, because there are articles about her talking like she would. But then she's not in the records for actually having gone. Um, but her son was set to leave for war at any moment, so it's possible that in this moment she decided that she was going to go see him off instead. I'll become an NWP representative to make up for it, which she did that next year. She became a representative. Louise marched without her sister. On October 6, 1917, she headed out behind Alice Paul with nine other women from across the country. One reporter wrote, that the pickets changed her mind on that specific day, October 6th. I thought that picketing was a rowdy and unlovely thing. I found it a silent, a still thing, a thing sublime. A crowd gathered. Four banners were knocked off their poles and the women silently tried to replace them. The police showed up, charged the women with obstructing traffic and sent them to jail. Hand over the banner and get in. After several hours of waiting, they were released on bail. Then they waited two days for their trial. Louise spent their, this time mentally preparing to go to prison. I can't even fathom what it will be like, but I will not pay that fine. Some of them had an option to pay a fine or go to the workhouse, uh, which is basically prison, but you would also work. Um, she's saying, I will go to Occoquan, which was the name of the workhouse that they went to. But at the trial, um, the, the women remained completely silent, except for Alice Paul, who said, we do not wish to make any plea before this court because we do not consider ourselves subject to this court, since as a disenfranchised class, we have nothing to do with the making of the laws that have put us in this position. The judge did not send them to the workhouse that day. No, ex no one explained exactly why, even though others had been given 60 days for picketing. And so, there we have Louise. She's saying, you should release the other women then. My friend Mrs. Kendall is wasting away in Occoquan for the same crime. Exhausted, Louise went home to Buffalo. The other women stayed and continued to protest. Many ended up in prison a few weeks later. 
I feel guilt for leaving, but I know I helped. She and Elizabeth continued to organize for the National Women's Party until the 19th Amendment passed and kept fighting for equal rights long after women got the vote. It takes many people to change the world. Small acts add up. How do you want to be remembered? These two women, um, they, they aren't necessarily famous in any way. These stories was pieced together just from, from articles, from fragments. Um, and I feel like in some way I had this opportunity to bring them back to us, even though we didn't know about them. Um, so, but it made me think a lot about this question. How do you want to be remembered? How, and so I'm asking you, and maybe you can think about that as I keep going and keep talking about how it is that we, we piece together these histories. My exhibition, as many of you saw today, starts with a timeline. These sort of events, these facts of things that happened. I feel like there's so much more to history than just those facts. There's all this space in between. Um, and how these things relate to one another. And that's kind of what I strive to focus on in my artwork. I try to look at the space between these moments. Um, and also, I try to look at how these histories get written. So in this case, the reason we know Seneca Falls, the reason that we know Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony so well, of course they did a ton for the movement, and it makes sense that we would remember them. But also, they wrote their own history. Um, it was a three-volume thing. and. They, they spent a long time on it, and it acted as a sort of propaganda for their movement. It made people uh, unite together, knowing that they had this history behind them, and to continue fighting into the next generation. But the reality was, much of that history was biased, like other histories are. Uh, and actually, it had a lot, it was mostly about them in some way. It was centered around their idea of what the movement was. So in my project, I tried to think about how that history gets written. Um, and specifically, I tried to look at the pieces of that history that are sometimes glossed over or that we don't talk about as much because they're hairy and complicated and don't fit perfectly into the story. So there are three themes that I really focused on, um, one being how women uh, use stereotypes that, to kind of hurt themselves and how they worked against each other. So in spe specifically, there's a series of etchings in the show um, that are inspired by Lady's Goatee book, or Goatee's Lady book. Uh, the Lady book was published in the mid-1800s and all throughout the Civil War, but throughout that time never mentioned the Civil War at all. Um, and part of that was because it was assumed that women were these moral, higher, spiritual beings that shouldn't deal with the world. They should stay elevated into the land of morals and maybe charity and then maybe taking care of the family, um, but certainly not in the gritty, uh, gross stuff of politics. Um, and so uh, a lot of it just focuses on fashion. So these series of prints, we have 5,000 men died at Gettysburg. Maybe we should end slavery? Radicalism is unbecoming of a lady, and our dresses keep getting more amazing. So just sort of a satire of what um, this history was like, or of what this publication was doing to women and to their ideas. Another theme that I focused on is the relationship of spiritualism and suffrage. Um, so spiritualism uh, is was, uh, talking to the dead, uh, having seances, conjuring the dead using a Ouija board or simply channeling the dead and letting them speak through you. Um, and what's interesting is a lot of early suffragists were also spiritualists. And part of the reason for that is that spiritualism gave women a lot of leadership opportunity and also even let them speak in public, which believe it or not at the time was pretty taboo to get on stage in front of an audience and speak. Um, but if they were channeling dead people, it was okay. And interesting enough, um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, just days before um, she wrote her Declaration of Sentiments, was at a seance 
and spoke, channeled the dead and heard rappings to the point where she wrote home to her family about it. And there's a letter at the University of Rochester that references this and her hearing these rappings. And then she wrote her Declaration of Sentiments at that same table where she channeled the spirits. Um, and there was the sense and whether it was metaphoric or real, that all of the spirits were behind her when she wrote that first Declaration of Sentiments. We hold the tru these truths to be self-evident that all men and women were created equal. She got the courage in some way, maybe, from spiritualism. We don't know for sure. I'm filling in the gaps a little there. But there's still, there's truth to this history of spiritualism um, that is less, considered throughout the history of suffrage because it was edited out. Why was it edited out? Well, they needed to keep their story as precise and clear as possible, and channeling dead people certainly didn't go with that. Um, but it was made even worse because there was a notorious woman named Victoria Claflin Woodhall, with, who was a spiritualist, a suffragist, a free lover, and a presidential candidate. Uh, she actually also had a stock brokerage firm where they would speak to the dead to get stock advice and then they would sell the stocks. Um, and actually they assembled that information because they had a network of women who had relations with men who were of wealth and power. Um, so this woman was of course surrounded in scandal though she ran for president. And eventually it became quite important for Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton to distance themselves from her as much as possible, even though she did make uh, a few steps in women's suffrage that helped them. Like she was somebody who helped, she, she wrote a memorial with the help of some lawyers that said that women actually had the right to vote all along and they just needed to claim it, uh, which inspired people across the country along with um, Virginia Minor who also went to try to vote and vote illegally, and then some of them ended up um, being arrested, but in a much sort of, like, when Elizabeth Cady, or when Susan B. Anthony was arrested for voting, they just, like, came over and asked her to come with them. Like, they didn't handcuff her. It wasn't, like, violent. It was, like, kind of a show. So it was a very different experience that Susan B. Anthony had getting arrested than some of the women who were part of the National Women's Party who picketed at the White House. But... Um, their traditional phrase that they would use in the early suffrage movement was organization, agitation, education. It's used by a lot of other social movements as well. Um, so this is just an embroidery I made adding this idea of no miracles. It's just these three things hitting home that this is all this is about. Um, and some degree it feels kind of like women were editing out the reality of some of their inspiration um, and sort of fitting themselves in to the traditional uh, patriarchal structure in order to get women the vote. And then, of course, the last thing that I deal with in this comic is racism within the suffrage movement. Um, after the Civil War, there was a moment when um, white people and black people worked together to try to get everyone the vote. Uh, they were called the American Equal Rights Association. And um, when that fell through, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony were super upset and offended. They saw themselves as these educated women who deserved the right to vote. And if there was going to be a hierarchy, they should get the right before black men got the right to vote. Um, specifically educated women, which equated to white women, right? Or for the most part. Uh, which is, of course, upsetting, especially when uh, it echoes through history to the civil rights movement. Um, and to this, so this is Fannie Lou Hamer trying to register for vote, to vote. The call for educated suffrage eventually grew into racist literacy testing and impeded universal suffrage for nearly a century. You'll need to interpret this arbitrary piece of the state constitution to my personal standards. So, this is quite a difficult topic to confront. Uh, how do we write this history? We want to celebrate women who helped find change and to actually make it so that women could vote. But we also have to confront the parts of the history that make us uncomfortable. 
the fact that not all of their arguments were um, good or okay even. So I decided to use spiritualism to try to help me deal with this problem with the history. Um, it, it worked for Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Maybe it would work for me. Uh, and so I put Susan B. Anthony on her deathbed being confronted by uh, civil rights activists f visiting her from the future. This is a reworking of a story that exists. There's a famous story by Anna Howard Shaw about um, the women who visited uh, Susan B. Anthony on her deathbed. She saw all of these women file past her uh, right before she died. And they were the, all of the, the people who had, she had worked with in her lifetime that had since passed away. And um, so in my project, I decided that instead I would have folks visit from the future and tell Susan B. Anthony that it's guilt she felt because nobody's free until everybody's free. This project was all about getting people to also feel the need to confront some of their own prejudices. So in the center of the room, there's a sculpture of, of this comic frame. It's Susan B. Anthony on her deathbed uh, with ghosts of the civil rights activists looming over her and making her remember um, and think about the things that still need to be done. But the ghosts also confront you as you turn around and look up at them. Because again, I'm interested in the way these histories get written and what gets left out. This is a painting that's in the exhibition uh, about Mary Church Terrell. So we don't know this and it's not often shared, but there were a few black women who protested at the White House gates with Alice Paul. Uh, the reason we know Mary Church Terrell protested at these gates was because she wrote about it and because Alice Paul mentioned it in an interview. It was said that there were other women who did this, but we don't have their names. What does it mean that we don't have their names? I mean, it means that somebody chose not to record their names, even though they have lists and lists of all of the white men, women who went. Why would they do that? I don't think it's, it, was, it was a bit systematic. They were concerned that if they put their names in the suffragists, they would lose voters for the 19th Amendment. Um, so it was a political decision, um, but that doesn't make it any better. And so I'm interested in trying to look at these pieces that we don't always have in history and how do we piece together uh, history from those fragments to write a more complete and thorough history. And so here's Alice Paul, right after the 19th Amendment passed, being confronted by the ghosts. She put in her work, but there's so much left to do. There really is a lot left to do. As I was working through this project, I read a lot of history books, um, and I was really inspired specifically by one. This is Women and the Historical Enterprise in America, Gender, Race, and Politics of Memory, 1880 to 1945. In this book, it talks about how women historians in the late 1800s and early 1900s were often undermined for their non-scientific subject matter. Things that qualified as non-scientific include the history of daily life and women's work, using letters as source material, except those written by powerful white men, Native American history, at first, many women fought for legitimacy. As some of the first women with PhDs, they longed to be accepted by male historians. My dissertation on money and power. While they often found college jobs, they were paid less, overworked, and not eligible for research funding. I've written three books. What have you been doing? She's been grading. Frustrated, some women turned their energy to reform instead. So here's Edith Abbott, who worked at Hull House, and later published Women in Industry, arguing that women had a long history in the workforce. Others ignored historical norms and wrote the histories they wanted to research. So here's Angie Debo, who wrote extensively on the US government's mistreatment of Native Americans. 
And while these women were never compensated fairly for their work, they pushed at the fences on the edges of academic history until their male colleagues began to write more progressive histories as well. I feel in my project, the reason that I do what I do is to push at the edges of what history can be, to, to bring some of the pieces together that most people just like can't fit in because they're historians and they have to follow certain rules, um, and to tell that history in such a way that maybe it helps us imagine and reframe where we're going. I guess that's a little bit of how I want to be remembered. Um, and it's a small thing, but I think we can learn from the Lewis sisters that these small acts really do add up. Thank you. Do you guys have any questions? And also I have a couple extra slides in case you don't. Yes, Dr. Getz. Mm -hmm. Sure, so the ones that had quotes were written as quotes somewhere. Uh, in this case with the Lewis sisters, they were just in newspaper articles, which some people might argue, especially from this time period, are not the most reliable source because newspapers did not have the fact checking set up back then like they do now. Um, but sometimes that's all you got. So they're quotes from newspaper articles. Oh, okay. So the question was why certain uh, word bubbles had quotations around them. Yeah, Denasia. There was, it was a little bit harder to find that information. Oh, the question was, was it more difficult to find information um, about the black women that I spoke about in this presentation? Um, I, there's a growing uh, field, and it's definitely more, a lot more people are starting to talk about the history of women's civil rights activists specifically, but I did find that there wasn't enough, you know? I think that if, if anyone's interested in the history of women in the civil rights movement, research it, go into that field, because um, my feeling was that it's usually the men in that history that, that, that have a bigger role, um, and those other stories have still not been fully written. But there are women like Septima Clark and Ella Baker and Fannie Lou Hamer, um, whose stories are just completely fascinating. And I only like kind of started to scrape the surface in this presentation, but there's more in my book, but there's also more out there that I can't wait to keep seeing emerge. Any other questions? Oh, Ms. Drozd. Good question. So the question was, how does my process work with my emotional reaction to the things I'm researching? Um, it's, my process is I try to read as much as I can and then work intuitively. So it's, of course, very uh, driven by my emotions. Uh, but also, I'm looking for connections. I'm looking for moments where history rhymes. That's how um, Mark Twain explained it. But the, I don't even think he really said it. We're talking about crediting quotes. Uh, we don't know who really said history rhymes, but I like it, so I'm going to use it. Uh, meaning that certain moments in history sort of echo through time, and you see that similarity. Um, I'm fascinated by that. So a lot of the way the, the catalog and the show was structured in order was sort of this poetic, like this kind of relates to this. And so I move forward that way. I wouldn't call it emotional as much as poetic or intuition. Yeah. Yes, Miss Green. Thank you. Um, so she asked, do I, did I do any travel uh, as part of my research in this project? 
I, I didn't travel extensively. I did visit the Vassar College Special Collections and I looked through, um, I got to see real ephemera that kind of inspired me. I got to see, see real suffrage banners and um, original letters between Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, um, which was really cool. But a lot of it, I wish I could have done more travel, honestly. But it's also like, how much more will I get from doing that? I did go to Seneca Falls, of course, and I saw Elizabeth Cady Stanton's house, and I went to the hall and all that stuff. And one thing that really moved me was, if you've ever been, and I, I know we took at least one class to see uh, the, the Women's History Museum in Seneca Falls. What is it, what's it actually called? Does anyone remember? Women's Hall of Fame? Yeah. Uh, I was very moved by how kind of just put together that was. Like, it's just posters on foam core in a room. It looks very grand from outside, but this was like a DIY thing, people recording their own history so that it, they had that memorial. And now they are getting a new building that's going to be beautiful, but there's like a certain amazing kind of feeling in that room to see just like that people have to like construct their own history sometimes in order to have a memorial at all. Uh, any other questions? Yes, Morgan. Uh, it took about two years total. Uh, I'm not completely finished. I'm going to go back in and add some more biographies of some of the women and kind of develop the characters to make it into more of like a booky book that might eventually be like published in more of a small format. So, yeah, it took two years. Uh, one comic to draw, to, like one page comic takes like between eight and ten hours. And then uh, that's like from start to finish. And then the research, usually I would research uh, a segment for like a week and then work on drawing it for like a week. So. We, got, we still have a little bit of time. So I can go through these last couple of slides. Um, I just thought it'd be interesting to know how I started doing this kind of artwork. Um, this is me when I was seven at, <laughs> at a historical society uh, tour in, uh, in my hometown outside of uh, Chicago. So every year I would, I would be part of this tale of the tombstones and I would get dressed up and pretend to be a historical figure. Um, and in particular, this one I am being an Iroquois theater fire victim. So the Iroquois theater fire is the reason that doors and theaters open outward. Um, because a bunch of people uh, passed away, unfortunately, when a, a fire broke out on stage in Chicago and rushed, everyone rushed to the door, and they couldn't get out because everyone was piling against the door. So when Ms. Droz has you guys, like, announce all the exits, there is, like, a very real reason why. And a lot of people died because of it. Um, and then the other thing I have here is just, I was in this, I was in the newsletter for American Girl Dolls, which is like a little bit nerdier than being in the actual magazine. And I was like 11 at the time, so I was super embarrassed by it. But now it's kind of a neat artifact. Um, here are just a couple slides of my other work. Um, in particular, this was for, uh, just a last year, crazy enough, though it feels like eons ago. Um, for 10 years, I've been publishing a comic that I put out every other month, um, and actually 11 years now, and um, it's just, it's different each month. The format changes a little bit each time. The subject matter keeps changing. When I first started, they were all about uh, failure, and usually failure of individuals throughout history. I'd say now it's more about like systemic failure and the problems in systems and uh, so I'm interested in climate change. My next project is about the history of the oil industry. Um, and anyway, but it, it all starts with these little pieces, these little fragments, which is another reason I really like the Lewis sisters uh, sentiment at the end of, of the comic. And here's just an example of just how much, how many comics I've made, these fragments, little history fragments. And then here's a cartoon. This is the first one I made that actually made it into the New Yorker. Um, so now we're leaving the hall of stuff we stole from other cultures and entering the hall of stuff we paid too much for. So similar themes about how history is determined by external factors like money and, and those kinds of things. <laughs> 
This piece was about the history of um, the American dream, the idea that you could lift yourself up by your bootstraps, which just that phrase is kind of nuts, right? Like that phrase, think, imagine actually physically trying to lift yourself up by your bootstraps. Um, so I took source imagery for this from different old editorial comics, and they were often drawing people like Rockefeller wearing these giant money bags. So I just took that stuff as fact and then presented it as a history exhibit where we have um, the rich people wearing these big money bags and the poor people being four inches tall and living in tiny huts. So there's actually one on display. One of their houses is in one of those little cases. Here's an example. This is a comic that was at the Rochester Contemporary Art Museum for um, the Frederick Douglass uh, 200th anniversary of his birth. And it shows eight different perspectives of the Douglas Monument at the time that it was created. So when it was built in Rochester, it was the first monument of a black person in the United States. So it was a big deal. Um, so the drawing in the center of the monument was done by hand, and then it's projected over it are, is the comic content. Mm, I honestly can't remember the year. I'm sorry. Yeah, but it was Elizabeth Cady Stanton actually spoke at the unveiling. So that's like the time period. Um, so those are just a couple of my other projects I thought it would be interesting for you guys to see. Um, any last questions before we wrap up? Danesia. How long was I like installing the art show at the museum? Oh, how long will it be up? Great question and helpful for me to share. Thank you. Um, it'll be up until January 31st. So uh, still time to go see it. Hopefully, even if we lock down, we'll have some time to see it. So any last questions? OK. Oh. That's a great question. So she was asking about the intergenerational sort of tension um, throughout the suffrage movement. So I think specifically inspired maybe by uh, Alice Paul and the National Women's Party, when they were picketing at the White House, NASA, uh, the National Association, uh, American Women's Suffrage Association, uh, was a little bit more conservative about that and were very upset that those women were protesting at the White House. They thought it was showy and unnecessary, especially when it continued into World War I, um, because they felt like it just wasn't giving respect to the president, um, and it was not kind, and it was not ladylike to do that. Um, so there was this tension, um, and I think that's what's kind of amazing about the Lewis sisters because they're these women in the, her, their 50s who went and protested with Alice Paul and said, no, we're going to do this. That was actually a very brave thing um, because they did face some repercussions for that. Um, so I think that's what's important is when it comes to the intergenerational tension. It's that it's not like it's always one way. You know, it's just a tension of ideas. And sometimes I think it can be painted like it's one generation, the older generation, telling the younger generation that, that they're being out of line or too radical or asking for too much all at once. But it's, it's sometimes they're always the outliers, you know? So I feel like in reality, it's more just like tension. It doesn't have to be about age. That was a good question. Okay, great. Thank you, guys. How lucky we are. I, I reiterate that. But um, in your gaps that you filled in a little bit, I think 
your intent was to open up my curiosity even more. All I want to do is get out and learn more. So if that's what great art does, I feel you've produced great art for us. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, collect anything you might need four times. We may not be head back tomorrow for a few weeks, okay? So make sure you get home with everything. Caitlin, thank you. This I wanted so desperately to get through this day with us all together. So, yeah, the governor was with us, so great. But everybody, thank you, Caitlin. Have a great day. Goodbye. And we'll see you all as soon as we can. Thanks. <laughs>